Good morning, everyone. My name is Peter. This is my wife, Margarita. We welcome you to Sunday service, especially those who are with us as visitors and guests or for the programs here this weekend at the Expanding Light. I'd like to continue the service reading from Rays of the One Light, parallel commentaries on the Bible and Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda, based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Reading this week is Perfection is Self-Transcendence. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. We begin this week with a passage from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. If ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the tax collectors the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even pagans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This teaching is a continuation of last week's lesson. To love all equally is possibly only by seeing God everywhere, in others as well as in oneself. See whatever comes to you unasked for as a manifestation of his will. Be grateful for the pains you experience, for there are healing strokes of his love. Sometimes healing is affected only by strong measures, but his love for you is manifested in the very attempt to heal. Strive always to be impersonal, as though whatever happens to you were happening to someone else. Persecution gives us a supreme opportunity to not deny the thought, this is happening to me and to affirm our inner freedom from the thought of ego. Don't allow the negative perceptions of others to become your own self-definition. Seek God. This is the true goal of life. Though how difficult to cling to in the midst of hatred, spite, and persecution. The Bhagavad Gita tells us in the seventh chapter, out of thousands, one strives for spiritual attainment. And out of many blessed true seekers who strive assiduously for me, one perhaps, perceives me as I am. O truth seeker, be one among all the thousands who seek the supreme goal. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, I'd like to continue <coughs> with a reading from Whispers from Eternity, Prayer Demands by Yogananda. Teach us not to follow the will of the wisp of false happiness. Through the long night of error, we pursued the will of wisp of false happiness. Gloom led only to deeper gloom. Our feet struggling to follow the path of progress often slipped into ruts and struggled through marshes of disillusionment. The deceiving Elmo's fire of passions lures, lures many people to their doom. Thousands are sucked down into the bog of sense satiety. O divine friend, extinguish thy breath this false light of destructive glee, which has so often misled thy children, headed for thy home. Light instead thy beacon of holy radiance, that every eagle, eager child pilgrim safely reach thy home. <clears throat> when I first read the, <clears throat> the Bhagavad Gita passage this week, I couldn't help but think back to uh, school times, or maybe it's because I'm doing this with my son these days, but it sounds to me like one of those math word problems, doesn't it? Like if there's uh, 6.8 billion people on the planet, and out of every 10,000 people, one person seeks God. And out of the 10,000 people that seek God, one sees them. How many people are going to find God on this earth? <laughs> so if you, you know, remember how to do these word problems and you do that, you come up with the answer that your chances are about one in 100 million and maybe we got 70 people on the planet who are going to find God. <laughs> well, that's not such great odds. <laughs> but Yogananda said, our odds are better. We practice Kriya Yoga. We know where the truth is. We know how to find God. But even so, even with Yogananda, think about his life. He, 
in the 1920s, he went out on his spiritual campaigns around the country and he preached to thousands. Thousands came. Of the thousands that came after he stopped his campaigning around the country, how many stayed with him? At one point, he had a handful of devotees at Mount Washington, his headquarters, and they were planting tomatoes on the hillside to make it work. So it's, uh, it takes a bit to find God, even with a master, even with that magnetism. And we talk a little bit about the things that Jesus is saying in here today about loving your enemies and hating those that hate or loving those that hate you. It's, it's not necessarily an easy path. And I want to talk about that a little bit today and see if we can get a little leg up. But before we do that, I also need to, as long as we're on the school theme, we need to go back to spiritual path 101 here. And I want to remind you of three basic things that we want to keep in mind during this talk. First, what unites us all as people? We're seeking happiness and we're trying to avoid pain. That's a given. Next thing, what is the nature of the universe? What is the true reality? The true reality is unity. The scriptures all tell this. True reality is sat chit ananda, ever existing, ever conscious, ever new joy is the way Yogananda translated uh, sat chit ananda from the Vedanta scriptures. That's number two. Number three, What is it we really need to do? We really need to go and seek that unity. And how do we do that? We get past our own self-definitions, past the bonds of ego consciousness to expand, to experience Satchitananda. So we're seeking happiness. The nature of the universe is happiness and bliss. We try to seek that through breaking down the ego. Okay, so let's go back to what Jesus' commandments are here. Be ye therefore perfect. Love those that hate you, that despise you. Love your enemies. Go out of your way to give them energy. It's a difficult teaching. Why, why are we doing this? Why are we trying to do this? Sure, it's a, it makes a nice way for people to live in the world. And a lot of people would dismiss this as merely being that, that merely saying, well, Jesus was really a social reformer. And what he was trying to do was get people to stop killing each other and actually be able to have a normal society and live together. But it's, uh, it's much more than that. And that thought, though, is echoed a lot in our modern times. If you think of, think of uh, Marx, even though we don't live in a communist society, the thinkings of Marx had a profound impact on us. And what did Marx say? He says all these great commandments of the religions, the Ten Commandments of Christianity and the laws and the Quran of Islam and the Yamas and Niyams, Hinduism. What did he say? He said it's the opiate of the masses. He said these rules are just a way to keep the workers oppressed and so the capitalists can alienate them from the fruits of their labor and we can keep the capitalist society going and we need to break those bonds just as well we broke all the other ones. Well, he had a few things wrong. That was one of them. But there's also, it's in the sense you see that in other, <coughs> in other things. Look at Freud. Freud said uh, the, the problems we all experience are because we're suppressing, our, we're suppressing our true nature. Our true nature is just a glorified animal. And really all those things that are lurking in our subconscious, they're the ones that cause the problems. And it's all these rules of society, all this repression is causing us these difficulties. The existentialist philosophers, they said values are all relative. Be radically free. Just pursue what you want to pursue. And then people say, well, you know, all these rules of religion, all these commandments, that's just to, to keep people in their place. But for the devotee, it's much, much more than that. It's not, sure, that works. It's nice to have these rules because there's about 100 million people out there, or hundreds of millions that aren't seeking God, and it's nice that they'd obey some of these rules. But for the devotee, it goes much beyond that because let's think back, what are we trying to do? We're trying to seek happiness. We're trying to seek it in Satchitananda. What is Satchitananda? Satchitananda is a unity. What do we have to do? We have to affirm that unity in everything we do. That unity is just as much in the murderer, in the rapist, in the enemy, in our persecutor, as it is in our friends. Sure, it's easy to love our friends, but what we want to do is affirm that reality of Satchitananda in everything we do. So we can get step three there. We can seek to break those bonds that keep us from all those around it. So this was a commandment of Jesus really to love all as a way of purifying ourselves. It helps them too. It helps society. But it's really for us. It's really for us as devotees, 
as a way to move beyond these bounds of ego consciousness to experience what we're really trying to experience. The same thing, let's take another one, truthfulness. Sure, it's great to have truthfulness. It's a great way to have in your family, in your classroom, in your community. It builds trust. It makes things a lot easier when everybody's truthful and everybody can trust each other. But it's also much more than that. It's much more than merely making things nice in society. What is truth? Truth, fundamental principle number two, sat chit ananda, ever existing, ever conscious, ever new joy. That is truth. If we're trying to affirm that, we want to affirm everything that supports that, everything that goes and brings us to that truth. When we start lying, telling falsehoods, we get mixed up in this little vortex that's just right here. It's not expansive. It's not connecting with what's all around us. It's one little vortex that's only holding us in. Think how much energy it takes to just keep lies going, to keep untruth going, to keep these little things swirling around in there. And how does that, what does that do? It separates us from everybody else because there is one reality. And if we all start making up our own realities, we're caught in those realities, but we're not expanding into anybody else's reality. And we're not expanding into Satchitananda. So that truth, and as the, the yamas and the niyamas say it, it's non-lying. Because it's really, the truth is there. What we're doing is our ego is putting boundaries on it of things, wishing things other than what they were. Looking at the world and, you know, there's some basic ways of, of lying and, you know, pretty blatant, just misstating the facts. But there's a lot more subtle ways of, of non-truthfulness. And that's wishing things were other than they were, trying to find a way that, to avoid what you see as reality, but you don't really want to deal with that reality. It's looking at yourself and not really dealing with some of the things that you're trying to think about, that you're trying to deal with. That's what also non-lying is. But it's important, the yamas and the niyamas come from Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And Patanjali was a great yogi, a realized master who lived, oh, they're unsure, but 1,500, 2,000 more years ago. And his, he wrote his Yoga Sutras and he said, what we need to start with are these basic restraints. And the restraints are ahimsa. It means not non-violence, but that really means loving. It means by not doing violence or separating, then if we renounce that, then we're in love. We are relating to all our enemies, even those that, that persecute us. Non-lying or truthfulness. We're relating directly to that truth. If we can just stop those barriers from us of telling those lies to ourselves, to other people. And that's why truthfulness is important, besides being part of a, a good thing to do for society. Okay, this leads us to a whole nother subject, and that is like, well, why is it so hard to just love your neighbor or to tell the truth or to do that? Well, there's delusion. And delusion is a force in this world, you can call it, <laughs> it's uh, created by Satan. It's created by that other pull that's pulling us away from Satchitananda. But there is delusion in this world, and delusion is strong. And typically, the scriptures talk about three basic delusions. Wine, sex, and money. There's some others. Kriyananda also adds in power and the search for fame. But the three biggies are wine, sex, and money. By wine, we mean all intoxicants of marijuana, alcohol, you name it, whatever the drugs, nicotine, cocaine, whatever it is that's taking your consciousness. And it's really, this is part of a practicing non-lying. When you're taking something, putting it in that delusion of saying, this is gonna make things other than what they are. I'm not really happy with what's going on around me because if I was living in Satchitananda without any ego bounds, I'd be in Ananda, I'd be in perfect bliss, but I'm not. So I'm gonna try to do something about it and I'm gonna take something from the outside. Well, that's a lie. It's not affirming what that truth is, what is really out there. It's saying, I'm gonna artificially try to change this. And people will say, well, you know, it helps me cope with this and it helps me experience that. But what happens? You come back down from that, there's that reality still. It's right there staring you in the face, just like it was. And experience has shown us that it gets much harder once you're hooked into these false stimulants. It gets much harder to face the reality. 
And if you can't face the reality, you can't find out where those ego bounds are, and you're never going to make it to Satchitananda. So it's powerful enough delusion. It's one of the big three, remember. It's powerful enough that Kriyananda made it one of the few rules of our community. He said, no drugs, no alcohol. It wasn't like you could play with it a little bit. He said, no, this delusion is directly opposite of where we want to go. It's taking us to escapism. It's taking us to the subconscious. It's not facing reality. It is not elevating consciousness. And that's why it's a delusion. Okay, let's go to delusion number two, sex. This is a big one. Why? Because God put something in there that we needed to continue the human race. I mean, all this delusion and all this suffering, why continue the human race? So he had to stick in a little bit of a... <laughs> I had to stick in a little bit of a, uh, something in there that said, uh, yeah, let's keep this going here. I want you guys to keep it going. And that's that creative life force. It's that magnetism between male and female to come together with that creative force. It's incredibly powerful. It's incredibly strong. And it's incredibly hard to resist. Should we resist it? No, we need to continue the human race. That's important. What should we resist is the delusive part of it. So back to our fundamentals. Delusion is when we are separated, when we are affirming the ego, when we're not experiencing the bliss. So often sex and other sensual pursuits can be looked at simply as, I want something from you. I, you. You are there. I am here. You are female. I am male. You are different. This isn't unnecessarily a oneness. Sex can also be used to help express a love between people. It's a very powerful thing. But too often in this society, it gets to be just the physical part of it, just that sense of the energy moving outwards. Is repression then the answer? I mean, should we go back to the days of the Puritans and just say, you know, nothing, yet, nada. That didn't really work all that well, and there were some problems with that. And frankly, I don't think we need to worry about that a lot in our society today, that sexual repression is running rampant and it's going to create problems for it. It's quite the opposite. And uh, this, this came home to me. I live here at Ananda Village, and it's a fairly quiet and uplifting environment. But recently, we took a trip down to Los Angeles over spring break and with my son and a friend. And we did the tourist things. We went to Hollywood and Venice Beach and uh, Universal Studios, and we immersed ourselves in Los Angeles. <laughs> 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 and it was, uh, it was quite a shock coming from here and just that sense of that that sexual energy that sensual energy being held up as this is the answer this is what you're looking for it's on every street corner there are billboards everywhere with all these beautiful smart i don't know if they're smart <laughs> these beautiful <laughs> these beautiful smiling that's what i'm going to say sexy people scantily clad in alluring positions often advertising alcohol while they're doing it <laughs> And it's just all over. And you see it in the people, the way they're walking around. I mean, go to Venice Beach one afternoon. It's all like, look at me, look at me, <laughs> look at my body. <laughs> it's just, it's pervasive. It's all out there. <laughs> Kriyananda had a great saying. He said, one of the things I would read in here, he said, and it's very just pithy. It's just kind of matter of fact. He says, most people have great difficulty not following the illusions of mass consciousness. And that about says it all. There's a mass consciousness that's stronger there, but it's pervasive in our society, in our movies, and our music, and everything that says, this is the answer. This is what you want to do. This is where you're going to find happiness. This is who you want to be. Well, it's a delusion. And what is so, what is the answer to this? How do we, we try to resist this mass consciousness? Well, the Bhagavad Gita says one of the ways to work with this is not repression, but transmutation. So remember, we're trying to break these bonds of this outward flowing, this downward energy that goes into the senses. What do we do? We have to reverse that flow, that transmutation of that energy, bringing it up. This energy is the strongest energy in the world. It is the creative force that can create life. But it can also be used for other things. It's that creative force for good works, for musicians, for artists, for dynamic writing, for dynamic focus and concentration in everything you do. And we find controlling that, being able to bring it up from the lower chakras up to the upper chakras, 
that creative force is incredibly powerful and can be used to do many, many wonderful things. And it doesn't say there's no place for sense enjoyment. It just says, remember the three principles. What are we trying to do? We're trying to seek happiness. If I continually indulge in letting that, letting that energy go, does that bring me happiness? See, look at the people around. Look at, see, look at your friends. Look at, your, look at the people in Los Angeles. <laughs> just see, do the experiment. Look at those people like Swami Kriyananda who are using that energy to bring it up and see what they can produce with that creative force. Okay, third delusion, money. Now money, this is an interesting one because money really is just energy. It's just congealed energy, energy that we need. It's a, uh, Yogananda called it a necessary necessity is what money was. Well, what's the delusion in money? Money can be used to do tremendous great things. We can create communities, we can build buildings, we can reach out to people, we can spread these teachings. That's a wonderful thing to do with money. What the delusion of money is, is that it allows people to think and to indulge the delusion that they're going to find happiness outside of breaking the ego bonds and going to Satchitananda. They're going to find it outside in the material world. And when you have lots of money and you live in a society like America, it's really easy to find things to spend your money on that are going to keep saying, I'll get that, I'll get that, I'll do this. If I had this experience, if I bought that, if I just had this, and psh, there it goes, money. And pretty soon, I need more money because I haven't tried the Hawaii cruise yet. And I need more money because I need a bigger house. This thing's only 5,000 square feet and my neighbor's got one that's 7,000 square feet. <laughs> that's the delusion of money. It's taking you outward. And it's interesting because in today's society, there's people, even the economists, even the economists are starting to tune into this. And there's studies that are, people are studying happiness. And there was one uh, a British economist who wrote a book about this. He's called Affluenza. And he, <laughs> <laughs> he started looking at people's self-reported happiness. So he asked people, so are you happy? And he went around the world and he asked people in lots of different income categories. And what he came to the conclusion was that after you reached about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per capita in U.S. dollars, you know, when adjusted for all these things like economists do to earn their living, they said after that there really wasn't much difference in self-reported happiness among those who are way at the other end of the scale versus those that were right there. So a certain level, you need a certain amount of basic necessities to keep your body together for health, for your well-being. But after you got that much it didn't really change happiness that much. There was also another study that was done by two Princeton economists. Actually, one of them was a psychologist, but he, he won the Nobel Prize in, in economics in 2002 for his work with the psychology of people and about happiness. And he found too, he followed around a bunch of rich people. Said, you know, those earning over $100,000, let's see what their lives are like. And then he also followed around a lot of people who didn't earn that much. And what he found out was the people who are earning more money were more stressed out, they were more worried, they spent less time on leisure, more time at work, and mo less time pursuing the things that they themselves reported mattered, like family, community values. Whereas those who didn't have as much money, especially in other countries, went and pursued those things. So it's not clear that money is going to get you happiness. In fact, it's not. You can use it, but remember, it can be a delusion too. It can draw you into that part that says, you know, that's moving me out of where I want to go. I'm just running after money. It's interesting, Kriyananda said, generally we haven't thought that that was one of the delusions we need to worry about at Ananda. <laughs> and we, uh, we don't have any rules that say, don't go after money, because we could use a, form, a few more resources here. <laughs> but it's interesting what Kriyananda said. He said, the one of the real tests of this community is going to come when we reach prosperity, when we start experiencing more prosperity, because in the earlier days, nobody had much of anything and there wasn't a lot of cars to go see movies or go to LA or do anything else, so you meditate. But as we got more and more affluent, there are these pulls of, well, I should really do this and I should really give this to my child and I really do need a bigger house. If I just had 10% more and, well, you know, my clothes, I really, you know, I mean, look, I've been wearing these rags for 25 years and I need some other clothes. So that delusion is there even here and it can be powerful. So you say, okay, Peter, you've convinced me. I'm going to stay off drugs and alcohol. I'm going to control my sensuality. I'm not going to run after money. I'm not going to seek fame and power. I'm going to be perfect. And you say, but dang, it's difficult. 
it's hard to be perfect. How do I do this? How can I keep from being pulled into these delusions? Well, we give you a couple of examples of things. First is to recognize the nature of delusion, because there's the, there's the big ones, wine, sex, money, power. But, you know, most of us are on a, on a little bit more subtle level than that. So how do we really recognize when we're getting pulled in the wrong way? Because the first step in this is to really look at ourselves, to experience, what am I experiencing? Am I going toward happiness? Am I going toward pain? Am I closer to Satchitananda? Am I not? So first thing, do I have, does it give me more peace of mind or less peace of mind? A delusion is going to take away your peace of mind. A delusion is going to affirm the bonds of ego consciousness. It's going to affirm that separation that I am this and you are not. Okay, second thing, it's going to separate us from others, from our family, from our friends, from our community. A separation rather than a unifying. And lastly, it's going to separate us from the support of the divine power that's coming through into this world. So those are delusions. What are virtues? Which way should we go? Go the opposite. What gives me peace of mind? What breaks down ego consciousness? What reunites me with my people around me, my family, my friends, my community? What brings me closer to the support of God? So those are delusion, those are virtues. Okay, what else can we do to this? Another thing we can do is look at those around you. Learn from others. Learn from their experiences. One reason to do this is to help them, obviously. If you see somebody falling in delusion, because of course you know what delusion is, but they may not know what delusion is, you can help them and you can point things out. That usually doesn't get you very far, but you can try. <laughs> the real reason for watching other people's is to learn from their experience. Because in essence, their delusion is our delusion. We can never judge anybody. We can never condemn that in delusion. We always have to express love and compassion because their delusions, all our delusions we share. We don't know what we did in all our past lives. We've probably done all these delusions many, many, many times over, but we forgot and here we are again. So we can watch other people and we can see when they put their energy in certain places, when they do things, does that help them? Are they seeking help? Are they getting happy? Are they getting more pain? Are they closer to Satchitananda? Are they farther away? Is their ego more solidified or are they breaking those bonds of ego consciousness? So really watch what's going on. You know, watch the, watch what happens when you go down the path of drug and alcohol. And we've, you know, we've seen it. We've seen kids in this own community. You can see what happens. Look at it out in the society. Unfortunately, there's plenty of examples. Looks what happens to those sex stars, those goddesses and gods in the movies. Are they living happy lives? What happens to that business mogul who just is focused on everything and money above all else? Are they leading a happy life? Uh, Kriyanand always likes to tell the story of Howard Hughes. He says, Howard Hughes was the richest man in the world when he died, and they interviewed him close to the end of his life. He said, are, are you happy? He said, nah, I can't say I'm happy. There it is, richest man in the world. Is he happy? No. And when I was thinking about it, I wanted to put a more concrete example that's more everybody can relate to. And my lexicon of pop icons isn't that extensive given that I live here in Ananda Village, but there was one that came to mind that was so, I won't say bright because that's the wrong word, but one so glaring that fit all these things that I couldn't resist doing a little bit more research on this to use this example. And again, I don't want to speak badly because this person, this person is a child of God. This person does have a soul. This person is someone that fundamentally inside her is looking for Satchitananda. But in this incarnation, she kind of got off on the wrong track. And I'm talking about Britney Spears. Is that she got all into all of them. She was, you know, a lot of sex appeal. She's beautiful. She was talented. She got trained as a musician. She was a mouseketeer to start with. That was pretty good with Disney. But then teenager year, she started recording albums. She became wildly successful, started making millions of dollars. She had, you know, status all over the world. She was looked up to, she had name, she had fame, all the money she could want, the fast life, living in Los Angeles. Well, then what happened? Well, at age 22, she decided to get married in a Las Vegas chapel. The marriage lasted for 55 hours. <laughs> Nine months or eight months later, she got married again this time to another entertainer who was at the time in a relationship with another singer. And that singer was expecting the child, the couple's second child and was eight months pregnant. 
but she left to get married with Britney Spears. Britney Spears had a child one, uh, one year later after that, had another child a year after that, was divorced two months after that, was in drug rehab three months after that, had all her assets taken away and put into receivership by her parents five months after that, and was condemned against her will to a, a mental hospital three months after that. So I don't think she was going the right way with this. <laughs> And again, you know, we need to have compassion, but we need to also live, learn from all these other people's lives around us of what, what we can see that that's, you know, that's not quite the way to, to go. The other thing we can do, we can look at our own experience, look at experience of others. We can also think about following guidelines that are put out by those that are farther along on the spiritual path or farther along in experience in life, closer to Satchitananda. That's where we get back to Jesus's things. Love your enemies. Be radically loving. Be truthful. Don't kill people. You know, there's some basic things that are out there. The yamas, the niyamas, the Ten Commandments. These people were farther along than we were. So maybe it'll be a good idea to follow those guidelines they were putting out because maybe it's more than just trying to keep society together. Maybe there really is something in that thing. Well, this works sometimes because some people like small children need a lot of rules. They don't have a lot of experience in their lives. And some people like true devotees have been bashed around enough and beat upside their head with a two by four of, of reality and pain that they go, yeah, you know, I should probably follow some of these guidelines because I didn't and I got really hit. But then there's a group in the middle. There's those hundreds of millions of people who aren't necessarily there yet and probably Fundamental among this group can be said there's a lot of teenagers in this group because the teens, what are they doing? They're looking for their own autonomy. They're trying to discover things. But they're not right, quite ready to say, you know, yeah, you guys really know what these guidelines are for. You know, really know what you're doing here. They want to discover it on their own. It gets into trouble. We need compassion, but we also need to reaffirm guidelines. We need to say, you know, these guidelines can be important because they are based on an experience. They are helping us go farther. And what's the last thing that we need? And that, of course, is divine grace. Because of those 100 million that are out there, how do you get to be one of the 70? It's really by tuning into that grace. It's really by channeling that in. So pray, pray, all of us, pray to stay on the right path. Pray to have the strength and courage like we affirmed in our affirmation. The courage to follow that right path, to go against delusion, to go to where we want to go. Happiness, Satchitananda, breaking ego bonds of consciousness. Pray for that grace, and when it comes into your life, it will make you perfect. spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are the they that mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are Blessed who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the 
peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. Blessed those reviled for righteousness sake. For theirs is the King.